say good morning to you this morning. Um, it is great to have you here, and we're glad that you braved the elements and the weather reports and all that, and you're here at church. Pretty much got your pick of a seat today, so that's a good day. And if you ever wonder what it was like to maybe to show up and get your prime parking spot, today's your day to find it, okay? So just uh, help yourself out there and uh, just be safe and uh, make sure we, you get back here next week too. But um, it is good to have you here. And we're going to learn together. We're going to grow together, worship together. Um, it's beautiful to come together as a body of Christ and uh, get on a journey that we can all make together. And we've been on that journey in First Corinthians now for several weeks. And I'm anxious to make progress and eventually get this wrapped up soon. So uh, we're definitely going to aspire to that goal. Uh, uh, are you staying warm? Everybody comfortable, right? Everybody's warm and because it's going to get really cold out from what I understand. Uh, I think some, somebody said something like Green Bay was going to be like negative 17 or 19 or something. So, you know what? Uh, I think I'm just going to stay with good old Stone Sill Community Church. That sounds good to me this morning. Nice and warm. And I don't know if I had a ticket. Of course, it'd be great to see that game. But if I had a ticket, I'm not so sure that would go. It's just, it's going to be brutal. So um, I recently uh, spent the night outside uh, in a sleeping bag, 0 to 14 degrees, somewhere in that range. And so I'm still trying to get warm. And so if I shiver every now and then up here this morning, you'll understand why I'm shivering. I'm still trying to get warm. Um, We have a wonderful study in front of us this morning. And um, it's a study that really it asks three things of us. Uh, First of all, I think we have to look at some guidelines that Paul uh, felt uh, and was inspired and felt was important to um, share with the Corinthian congregation. It was 1 Corinthians 14. There was one gift uh, among all the gifts, one gift in particular that had created some problems in the Corinthian church. And so Paul has to address that. So it's the one gift in the Bible that necessitated one old whole entire chapter be written to help explain how it should be used. So we need to look at that. And then a second thing that I think our text asks ask of us in light of today's uh, thinking as well in 1 Corinthians 14 is that I, I have to diffuse a controversial passage. And the controversial passage comes later in 1 Corinthians 14. And it's about women keeping silent in the church, asking their husbands at home kind of thing. Uh, And I believe in those words, but you'll have to hear me explain it before you can really uh, come up here and beat me to death after I'm done. Okay? (laughs) I would like to make it home today, if that's okay. I made it here. And women, please do not beat me up. Uh, It's a new year and we got a lot of good things in front of us. All right? Uh, no, really, it's not. There's nothing to be fight in a fighting mode uh, over in those wor- verses if you just understand the backstory. And I, as a teacher, give myself, I live, I thrive on backstory, okay, because it helps me uh, understand the text, all right? And uh, I have to understand the text or I can't sleep at night. That's just the, God's supernatural energy at work in me. I got to know what that book means. If I don't understand what that book means, there ain't no foot, ain't. There ain't no a little uh, West Virginian uh, twain coming through there. There ain't no football game or meal or gift going to make me happy unless I understand what that book means and understand it fully. Not that I can be perfect in my understanding, but I want to know as much as I can. And I bring that to you each week. It's an act of worship to Christ. So, I got to diffuse that passage. So you're going to have to give me a little time to do that uh, uh, more uh, toward the end of the chapter. And we'll be uh, selecting uh, selected verses here. So we're going to work through the uh, selection of verses. Uh, is, are there like pie crumbs on this table? <laughs> okay, that's good. I can just, uh, okay, that tastes good. And if I get hungry, I'm just, I got food to go. So, uh, and then the third thing is that I want to appeal to you for maturity. Uh, Paul does this, and I want to appeal that you be mature and that you grow up this year. And that's not to uh, disparage you at all or to create, critique or criticize your life. 
But Paul really emphasizes that one of the most loving things you can do is grow up, mature. And we often think, well, are we just going to repeat the same stuff year after year after year? Well, it's easy to do. And Paul wanted to kick them out of that cycle. And so he appeals that I want you to grow up and mature. And part of the growing up is I want you to let love dominate in all things. And really, this has kind of been like a series nested within a series. I've been talking a lot about love lately. And I really want you to let love flow through your life. That's my vision for you. I will routinely sit down with my kids and say, now listen, Megan, you know, I used to do this with her. Here's my vision for your life. Here's what I see God doing. I'm not going to be overbearing with it. I'm not going to impose. You're free to shape your life. But here's the vision I think I'm seeing and I have for your life. Will Levi, here's the vision I have for your life. This is what I want you shooting for. I do that all the time in so many ways. As a pastor, I bring that to you. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to push toward and lean into. And that is love. Love and to grow up and mature in your faith, okay? And especially in your understanding. So as I look at these three huge things on this cold, snowy January day, with wind chills that's going to go up and, and uh, or maybe I should say down, the temperature is going to go down because of it. Uh, can the Lord warm our hearts with this passage? I think he can. And as we journey through this, I think we have to understand that the Corinthian church environment was blessed with a lot of people, not a huge amount of people in the early going, but they had a lot of spiritual gifts represented in this body of believers. They had a lot of problems, too. And one of the problems among many was that they had elevated the gift of a prayer language or tongues speaking into a, a level or a status that it wasn't intended to be. And everything was, was uh, driven by this particular gift. And so uh, Paul has to deal with this, and he does so quite nicely in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, if we go to slide 4, though, what I just stated will be uh, substantiated with Paul's opening. This was uh, back when the series started, First, uh, First Corinthians chapter one. You do not like any spiritual gift. That's like a supernatural ability given by God in His grace to enable you to bless and edify the body of Christ. Uh, you have natural talents; those are God given, and then your natural talents. Okay, the God given abilities you have. Like I was sharing last week, if you'll make Christ Lord of your life, nobody can say Christ is Lord except by the Spirit. Remember that. If you'll make Christ Lord of your life, then you can use your natural abilities to lift him up and honor him in every way. So the natural abilities are God-given. The spiritual gifts, we could say, are Trinitarian-given. It's all God, right? A Trinitarian God. He works and he inspires and he energizes and he blesses. I need your gift. You need my gift, and together we team up and we see the body of Christ extend out and continue what Jesus started when he came and lived among us for 30 some odd years. And that's the beauty of it. And so these Corinthians had these uh, spirit energized giftings. Uh, they had one primary gift, and in some cases, perhaps more than one, or a spiritual gift mix where they had other characteristics, uh, energies at work in their lives. And you have a gift. You have an energy uh, about you in an area of life that can be used to bless the body. All right? But like I said, there's this one gift in particular that needed addressed. And Paul has to address this. Uh, And when you combine a misappropriated emphasis on a gift, trying to make that gift be everything and and much more than maybe it should have been, and you combine that with a self-seeking spirit, then you had a recipe for disaster, all right? And so this is what we had, a self-seeking, not a kind, patient, love is, chapter, you know, First Corinthians 13, all those things. It wasn't those things that were dominating. It was a self-seeking spirit. And anytime you bring that to a marriage, a family, a church, any group, a team, athletic team, whatever, anytime you bring a self-seeking spirit Uh, It is a recipe for disaster. So in 1 Corinthians 14, the house church meetings had become disorderly. No one could understand what was being communicated. 
And the inquirers who were checking out these unique meetings that were unlike any other meeting in the city, these inquirers were coming into these meetings and they were walking out of these meetings feeling like it was more like a frenzied pagan festival that was right out of some one of the pagan temples more than about lifting up Jesus. That's just how, how out of balance this gift had become. And Paul says he checks it. And they were not bothering to interpret any of what was going on. Uh, they had multiple tongues speaking sessions happening. They were not bothering to stop and interpret any of it. It was taking up all of their time. It was sensational. They weren't able to dig into the word together because under the leadership of a gifted pastor teacher, because it was all given to the sensational one gift. It was, a, it was becoming a one gift congregation and all the other gifts were being relegated to the sidelines and couldn't really work in the body like it needed to because the Corinthians, again, had, had prioritized this to a, a place where it shouldn't have been. And so Paul has to write about this. If we go to slide five in 1 Corinthians fourteen twenty seven, he says, if anyone speaks in a tongue or two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us that there were multiple prayer language sessions that were dominating the meetings, and Paul limits it to two or three. So he places a limitation on this. He tell, it tells us also that they were not waiting on the previous speaker to finish. So Paul says one at a time. You're just jumping all over each other, and it's not productive. And it's not edifying the body. And so he, he restricts it one at a time. And then this verse tells us also that they weren't bothering with interpretation. And Paul says, if this doesn't happen, interpretation of this, these phenomena, then I want you to be quiet or silent uh, in the meeting. And finally, this verse tells us that someone engaging in a prayer language gift should not have to say, I just couldn't help myself. It's not that kind of an oper operation. You can help yourself. We are in full control of our spiritual gifts. And Paul, he understands this and he lays out very clearly, this is how I want this to play out in order to, for it to be productive in your meetings. Okay? And so there's, there's order and there's a level of control. And so Paul is not disparaging the gift of a prayer language. He does seek to bring it under control. And again, hear me on this. His big concern is not whether or not people speak in a prayer language or tongues. Rather, what he wants to emphasize is what is appropriate in both their small group and large group assemblies. And so he very carefully, methodically works through this issue. A whole chapter is given to this because of, of the role it was playing in, in uh, the Corinthian church. So occasionally... You had all the house churches of Corinth that would come together. You may have four, five, six people meeting in a little small apartment throughout the city of Corinth. They would come together and then they would have um, these large group assemblies, these large group uh, meetings of all the house churches coming together. And we've talked to you. I've talked to you a little bit about that and some of the Lord's Supper abuses and things that were happening in those settings. Well, when they came together from these small groups, and they came together in large group assembly, the dynamics of everything changed. All right? Now keep in mind, Paul was presenting his recommendations and instructions with the understanding that the optimum setting for spiritual gifts to be used and at work would be in a small group setting. He didn't have a setting of 300 people in mind. A 300 people where, you know, if everybody brings a gift, we would be here for the next seven, eight hours. Right? He envisions small groups where everybody brings their gift to the small group. Four, five, six people. Everybody offers something. By the time you're done, hour, hour and a half later, the group has been edified and Jesus has been lifted up. Okay? So when we move this from the ideal setting, the small group setting, into a large group assembly setting, it changes the dynamic of a lot of things. And so uh, Paul understands this. And with, the, with uh, constraints and things of a larger group, also some of the other messages and things that were being conveyed through this uh, overemphasis on uh, prayer language, uh, he has to 
uh, give these, these qualifications for how this gift is to work. Uh, before, we, before we move on to these guidelines, let's look at slide six. Okay, if you're new today and you're wondering about what I'm talking about, uh, we work our way through the Bible methodically. We're in 1 Corinthians 14. It's in the New Testament. And it's a, a letter that Paul wrote to some early ancient Christians in 54 AD in, in Corinth. And, uh, and he's helping them work out what a new life in Jesus looks like. Okay, so that'll get you snapped in if you've not been with me for a while. All right. Uh, but this is what he says here in, on slide 6, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? I like the family terms. When you come together, in other words, when you come together, especially in your large group gatherings, each of you has a hymn, somebody brings a hymn, somebody brings a word of instruction, somebody a revelation, somebody a tongue, somebody else an interpretation. Listen, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. And so you came to these lively meetings of four, five, six people, maybe eight to 12 in other cases, and, and they had something to offer to the group to edify and lift up the group. And if you think about it, all the spiritual gifts, with the exception of maybe a few, all of them work best in small group settings where you can pray and minister and learn what people's needs are and can pray for healing for those needs. It's not really designed to work in a large group assembly just like this. Okay? All of the gifts, that is. All right, now listen to me. Slide seven. Paul talks about tongues or a prayer language. What is it? Well, anyone who speaks, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 14, in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. And we see in Acts 2, it was actually human languages that were being spoken. And then later, it expands out to include a prayer language of 1 Corinthians 14. And then we also see in verse 14 of that chapter, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. So it's a human language as well as a prayer language. And Paul addresses this. Now, one of the things he does in this chapter is he quotes Isaiah uh, uh, from the prophet Isaiah in 1 Corinthians 14, 21. Isaiah 28, verse 11, it's a loose quotation, okay? And as I'm digging into this, let me just read the verse, and I'll I'll explain to you what I think he's trying to convey. Uh, With other tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Why in the world does Paul jump out in the Old Testament, quote this verse, ram it back into the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 14, and try to make a theological point with it in this conflict uh conflict driven chapter why does he do that well backstory right we've got to understand what was happening when isaiah wrote those words and so again i dug into this and and back when isaiah wrote those words it was a time when uh, speaking to the whole nation of israel was important because the assyrians big mega superpower nation was breathing down the throats Uh, and at the doors of Jerusalem, and they were threatening to capture it. And through the prophet, God was warning the nation that if they do not repent and turn from their evil and idolatrous ways, they are going to hear foreigners talking in the holy city. That's what the verse is talking about. If you guys don't repent, destruction's coming, and you're going to hear foreign languages that you've never heard before, those of the invaders... And it's going to be a sign of judgment. That judgment has fallen. And sure enough, my study reveals, sure enough, 100 years later, Isaiah's words were completely fulfilled when the Babylonians came in and and they took over the city in 586 B.C. And the streets of Jerusalem were filled with foreigners speaking strange languages and tongues, just like the prophet said that they would. Listen, here's the pattern. When Israel obeyed, they got prophets. When they disobeyed, they got foreigners. And so when we read on slide 8 now, slide 8, 1 Corinthians 14, 22, tongues then are a sign Not for believers, but for unbelievers. So what kind of sign? Is it a good sign or a bad sign? And when we look at this, we see that uninterpreted tongues are not a saving sign, but a sign of judgment. 
It's a sign of alienation that leads to judgment. So it's a sign uh, of uh, unbelief. And it's not so much meant to stimulate belief as it is to seal unbelief. And so if I'm an inquiring Jew in 54 AD in Corinth now, at the time this letter was written, and I show up in a Corinthian house church meeting, and I hear uninterpreted prayer language, not only would it not benefit me, it would be a negative experience of judgment, you see. So in other words, the inquirer or unbeliever is going to see this as condemnation. So basically how they're going to conclude this, they're going to hearken back to the time when the holy city was filled with foreign languages. And they're going to recall that. And then basically they're going to conclude, so you're telling me, you you believers in Corinth, that my heart is hard. You're telling me that you have kind of this insider language that you're not going to let me in on. Okay, you're telling me that I'm destined for judgment and I will never have God's favor just like the nation of Judah in 586 B.C. And you've got this secret vocabulary and these rites and you're not letting me in on it. So Paul didn't want to convey this to people because he knew that an age of grace had dawned in Jesus. And uh, to all people were invited to freely respond to Christ prior to the, to the coming kingdom. And so a new age is done in Jesus. And so Paul's like, we don't want to hang out this sign of judgment every week. And people wander in and they're trying to get, you know, wondering what this meeting in Corinth is about, these house church meetings and large group assemblies that we come together. We don't want to hang out this sign of judgment and, and mistreat this gift in such a way that it's, it conveys judgment on those who are a part of it. Slide 9 says, so if the whole church comes together, emphasis, whole church comes together. All the small groups come together and assemble. And everyone speaks in tongues and inquires or unbelievers come in. Will they not say that you are out of your mind, Paul says? So Paul is not, does not intend for this gift to be paraded in a large group public setting. It's not meant to do that and be used that way. And I know this may uh, contradict uh, some denominational beliefs and church beliefs and things, but it's not meant to be paraded in large group settings like this. Okay? Paul emphasizes that in this, in this passage. So tongues, we could sum up here uh, before we get to the guidelines. Tongue speaking or prayer language is something ancient. And it does spark the imagination. It's like a relic from the past that surfaces in modern times, but it has overtones of judgment, especially if it's not interpreted. And so when we look at this, we have to bear in mind, like I said last week, we've got to love the gift giver more than the gift because eventually this gift, as well as other gifts, is going to be phased out. And we learn this from 1 Corinthians 13. We won't need the gift of evangelism eventually. Why? All will be believers. We won't need the gift of healings uh, in the future. Why? All will be whole. We won't need uh, the gift of church planning in the future. Why? Everybody's in the church. We won't need the gift of tongue speaking in the future. Why? Because we will not have a hard-hearted Israel to contend with. Okay, so we use our gift, but we hold to them loosely and we understand that the gift giver and loving him and loving people is just as important, if not more so than than uh, demonstrating all the gifts for personal gain. Okay, so it's a legitimate gift. It's an ability to pray in in a language understood by God or the one who was given the gift of interpretation at the time. All right. And this gift Ideally, it's used privately in your own time with God or maybe with a prayer partner or it could be used in a small group setting with six to eight people together. But as far as the large group setting goes, I do not think that this gift was meant to be paraded in large group public worship service gatherings. Here's four reasons. Slide 10, reason number one. Again, to sum up, first of the argument he's making here in 1 Corinthians 14. 
It is for personal edification more than for the whole church. Verse 4, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. All right? And the point here is that since this gift is designated for personal edification, I believe the Bible teaches it should be used for time alone with God. And if you speak in tongues or a prayer language in your quiet time, uh, pray for me while you're at it. I always appreciate when people pray for me. Uh, And if we're in a public worship service here at church and you sense a prayer language moment, what I would encourage you to do, if this is your gifting, is I would encourage you, and I've talked to my prayer team about this, uh, to go join with my prayer team and pray with them. If this is your spiritual gift and you feel that there's in a moment that there is a, you're wanting to communicate with the Lord and, and, and there's a prayer language moment that you're in and you don't want to be disruptive and things, I would encourage you to go pray with my prayer team and they meet right back here. And I've instructed my prayer team on how to, how to uh, kind of be alert to this. And uh, some of my prayer team pray for me sometimes in a prayer language. And uh, what I would just say to you is, if this is your gift, go just quietly slip out and go pray with my prayer team. And then they will, they will make sure that it gets, things get communicated to me as, as need be. Okay? And that's probably the best way at this time for us to handle this spiritual gift in large group assemblies and settings. Okay? And so it is bearing in mind that it's for personal edification more than for the whole church. Paul makes this point, and we want to focus here when we're together in a large group. We want to focus on that which edifies everybody, the whole body. That's the point he's making. Okay? Uh, He says in verse uh, 28 of 1 Corinthians 14, If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. So that tells you that it's not some out-of-control phenomenon. We are in control of our faculties, okay? And so I'd encourage you to go that direction. Now, secondly, we are to focus on building others up, not ourselves in the public worship gathering. Verse 9, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. And that's why I would recommend that this gift be not be paraded in a public service. Rather, it would be uh, focused in small group settings or private settings or with the prayer team and let the Lord use your gift in that way. Uh, The third guideline, slide 11, it confuses unbelievers. Prayer language confuses unbelievers in the large group public service like this. Uh, He says on in verse 23, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, And inquirers or unbelievers come in. Will they not say that you are out of your mind? Right? And so Paul's like, it not only confuses unbelievers, but it can freak out a bunch of Christians too. Who are not familiar with the gift. All right? And so Paul says it can can be very uh, divisive if not handled rightly. And that's why if somebody would... Uh, feel a prayer language moment in the large group gathering, I would highly recommend you move that to the prayer team. And then again, the prayer team would bring me whatever the uh, words of edification they feel would be necessary. And I think we understand this and we kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, walk in these guidelines already, but I just want to affirm it because I do want to see the affirmation of every spiritual gift. This is not my particular gift. But I'm not going to say to someone, you can't speak to God in a prayer language. I'm not going to say that because that may be a gifting. And I'm not going to box God in. If God wants to speak through to someone and through someone that way, then God's God and I'm not. Okay? But I do think that from what we see here is that we can abide by these guidelines that I think that Paul is giving to us, again, to avoid a Corinthian type of issue. All right? Uh, Fourth and final guideline here, ideally, again, it's not meant to be used in a large group or public worship services and settings, but in the church, the large group gathering, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. Listen, he's saying, I'd rather say five words in a large group setting where all the small groups are together and you can easily understand it. You know, Jesus loves you. Praise God. 
five words. I'd rather do that than speak 10,000 words in a tongue. Okay? So again, the focus is in the large group, we're going to edify everybody. And we're going to teach the word. And we're going to make sure that's the focus. Because that will ground it. It will ground all the spiritual gifts and how they operate in the church. So, Jesus loves you. Praise God is more edifying, especially to some guy that comes in on a snowy day looking to maybe he, hear what God has to say. Never been to Stones Hill before. It's just going to work a whole lot better if we do it as Paul has uh, counseled us to do it here. Okay? So, if we go, uh, the, I'm sure there are probably more that I could say about this, but again, I've got con- time constraints too here this morning. And so, you know, we're all anxious to get out here and freeze to death, right? Uh, so, you know, I got time constraints. So I'm going to leave it right there. Uh, there's more that could be said about this, but I think this is probably going forward what needs to be stated at this point. So you can bear this in mind. If you have other questions, please f- feel free to shoot them, shoot them to me, and uh, we, can, uh, we can put them on the blog, or if you want to ask questions that way, and you can see in the, in the bulletin, you can see links there. Now, we made it through the guidelines. Uh, uh, purpose or objective number two here this morning. You ready? All right, women, buckle up. Here we go. All right, men, all right, put your arms down, protect your ribs a little bit. Okay, here we go. Big controversial passage. Everybody wants to go to war on these passages, these verses. Here we are. Slide number 12. Jump out to it for me, guys. Women should remain silent in the churches. Now, don't divorce this from our context. Women should remain silent in the churches. Now, if you get up and leave right now, you're going to miss it. All right? You're going to miss the full impact of this. Don't do that. Hang with me. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Okay? The women are quiet. All right? Listen. And the men are much too smart to amen right there. Okay? You're much too smart for that. Listen closely. I studied hard on this, okay? I want to do a good job of laying this out. I'm going to stay pretty close here because I don't want to get in a thorny bush. And I end up getting scraped up before I get home today. Listen. Listen closely. Paul is not discussing all Christian women, but rather married women whose husbands are believers in regular attendance at the small group Corinthian house church gatherings in 54 AD. Okay? And if we look at, again, we look at backstory, you have to understand Corinth was the largest city in Greece and it was the most diverse. There was an influx of multi ethnic groups. The languages spoken in the city would have been numerous. And added to this was the problem of accent. Anytime you have people learning secondary and languages and things, you have a problem of communication and of accent. And so when a speaker's words and phrases are not understood, there's this low buzz that can break out as listeners ask each other, what did she say? What did he say? What was that word that he said? And they're trying to sort this out in a very diverse, multi-ethnic background church. And a very small percentage, and this complicated it, a very small percentage of people, male and female, were literate during this time. So everything was verbalized. There was no text in front of them to read. It was an oral culture. And so you process things by talking it out. And the men would learn enough of the languages spoken in the city, the married men, 
They had to learn Greek, a little bit of Aramaic, a little bit of Latin, a little bit of Hebrew so they could go do their jobs and conduct business in the city. They, their jobs demanded that they be multi-trilingual or multilingual. And the women who were married, as the customs were, tended to be at home more, uh, attending to the home front. They didn't circulate among the people of the city as much as the men whose jobs demanded that they're out on the front lines of this, doing their jobs, communicating in a multi-ethnic setting. And so the married women who primarily were at home in this era would learn just enough vocabulary words to buy a few things at the market. And so when uneducated, many of them were uneducated. And when you have illiterate and limited educated uh, married women and they would get together in groups in Corinth, it was a special challenge because not only was it a social event where they got to hang out with people that were kind of from their, uh, you know, similar to their status in life, but they also had issues because there was no sound amplification in these large group meetings. Uh, and the large group, when the small groups came together, the large group could swell up to 45, 50 people. Things were happening in multiple languages. You had the issue of accents that were complicating the problem. You had others who were getting out of control with prayer language. And so this low buzz from the married women are like, I don't understand what's going on here. Do you understand what did he say? What did she say? And so it, it begins to build and build. And their husbands, who had to know all of these multiple languages, spoken languages, because they trafficked in them every day, they could track along pretty well. But the married women didn't have it easy, as easy of a time doing that. And rather than wait and let speakers finish, or rather than uh, give it some time, and maybe ask their husbands kind of quietly later, uh, there was this low buzz that would grow and grow and grow. And eventually the women, the married women just finally gave up. They started chatting and it came across as rude and disgraceful in the public assemblies. And so Paul says, you know, the women, the group of women, the married women, that where this is happening, he says, what I want you to do, ladies, is we'll do our best. I'll do my best to regulate what happens in your large group assemblies so you can get a lot out of it. But if you do me a favor, rather than interrupt the one that maybe it's a man that's prophesying, maybe it's a woman that's teaching, a man that's sharing a spiritual gift, or a woman, they're all sharing their spiritual gifts, male and female, nothing uh, discriminatory here. You have a spiritual gift, you were invited to share it, and you did. But he says to these married ladies, would you do me a favor, wait till you get home, your husbands who know the languages a little better than you, ask them and let them bring insight into what just happened and what was being communicated in the public meeting. Now, that's basically what was happening. This, these verses have been used to badger people and misrepresent Paul and make uh, God into something he's not. It's not that way. It's very practical what Paul is saying. I agree with him 100%. And so, and I think we can, all of us can too. Now, did I do okay defusing the scriptural bomb? I got a thumbs up. Okay, everybody okay with that? We're going to be fine. Nobody's going to revolt today. Okay, a third objective here. In light of all of this, and I'm anxious to move on to other things, okay? So I want to wrap this up here this, on this uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 12, 13, and 14 on this day. So just listen closely to me now, okay? Having said all of this, are you loving people the way you should? Okay? Did you know you can be extremely talented naturally and you can be gifted supernaturally by the spirit with a spiritual gift and if you're going to remain in a self-seeking frame of mind and state paul says it's a big zero when it comes to edifying the body of christ i don't think he's saying anybody is a zero no in christ man who would we would all be zeros outside of him so he's not 
putting zeros on people's heads. What he's saying is, you who have this talent and this ability, but it's always a self-seeking angle you're looking for to use it. He says it's zero stuff for the body. And uh, you can have the greatest ability in the world and it will fall flat in the shadow of your negativity. You know, some of you, I'm convinced, uh, could be absolutely sensational. Even just in using your ordinary gifts in a sensational, loving way, you could be sensational in the body. Some of you are talented. You've got all of you are talented. You all have abilities, various abilities. Some of you is athletic. Some of you is intellectual, and, and you're just extremely bright and smart. Some of you are mechanical. Some of you are relational. Some of you are well-spoken. Some of you are just really good thinkers. You're balanced. You're a hard worker. Uh, and what I sense this morning is what I, what I think Paul was sensing in this text is that you have so much love that could flow through your life and the love revolution that Paul was promoting here could just really take off in your life. But there's these things that have gotten in the way. See, you get hurt and you won't forgive and love stops. You get bored with routines, and so you've got to jazz up a spiritual gift just to make life interesting, because I'm bored. You get selfish and won't play your assigned role. I want more power, more authority. I'm not content to be in this role. Uh, you get irritated at God and make war with him, and we all do this sometimes, but it's, uh, some of us never get past this. We never grow past it. But we get irritated at God. We make war with God over his perceived not involvement in my life. And so God's not in control here. I can't trust him to take care of things. I'm going to promote my interests. Or maybe you get disrespected and you start looking for payback. Or you get cheated and you start keeping a ledger. 1 Corinthians 13. Here we are once again. Uh... Or you start feeling entitled and privileged because look how good I am at this. Or I can do what he can do, only better. Or she can do, only better. And with every decision like that, this is Corinthian stuff, okay? Every decision like this, love becomes less and less in your life. And maybe this morning, it's time that everything that comes out of your lips be filtered with a love filter. Maybe that would lift up Jesus in a greater way than ever before. And one of the most loving things you can do in 2014 is grow up. It's mature. And I'm not disparaging. I'm just presenting what Paul is saying. In fact, slide 13. Look at slide 13. This is back in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. Stay with me now. When I was a child, an epios, what is that? A three or four year old. When I was a three or four year old, I talked like a child, as in prayer language. I thought like a child, as in prophecy. I reasoned like a child, as in knowledge. First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The three biggies, where he ascends them. He starts with prayer language at the bottom. He works his way up to kind of defuse this emphasis in Corinth. And now he reverses it again and says, you know... There's coming a time, church, when these gifts are going to be phased out in light of, an, of, an, of a coming era. So don't fall in love with these things. Grow up. Use them as God enables you to use them. But don't make it all about you. Let love come through. And so I would just, and, and when you see this, he says, when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. What are the ways of childhood? I immaturely using my spiritual gifts. Immaturely insisting on self-seeking purposes in life. What, what, hey, are you still acting like a child when you should be acting like an adult? That's a question we really need to ask. And it will mess up our new year and it will mess up any group you're part of when you, when you refuse to grow up and you remain a little toddler. Uh, what, I thought about this. You know, I've, I've had three kids, all right? Well, I still have three kids, as far as I know. Uh, 
okay? And I thought about this. What have I observed in their lives? And then I went further. What have I observed in my own life when I was a little boy, a little three or four-year-old, an EPIOS, all right? What was I like? Well, I think we can safely say four things about children. Children are willfully defiant. I'm not doing that. Huh? Anybody ever do that in your family? You're like, Matt, my husband did that this morning. Okay. <laughs> no, no. I'm not doing that. And just please excuse and pardon the immaturity here. I just want you to get it. All right? And they stomp their feet and they set their little jaws and they fix their gaze. And they're going to tell you what time they're going to go to bed, what time they're going to get up, what they're going to have for breakfast, lunch, and supper. And what you're going to get them for Christmas and how it's all going to go. And if you don't do that, here comes the tantrum. Right? Huh? They were, Corinthians were doing that in the church. You won't let me use my spiritual gift. I'm not going to be a part of that. Right? That's what they were doing. And Paul says the greatest thing you can do is grow up. What a loving thing to do. And we don't have to watch this anymore. Okay? That's what children do. They're willfully defiant. What, what else do children do? They are superficially committed. Huh? Listen to me now. Who ends up putting the model airplane together that they got for Christmas? Who ends up doing it? Right? It's usually old dad, right? Or mama. Uh, it looks good. It looks fun and all that. And I'm going to put about half of it together. But who usually ends up doing the rest of the work? Huh? Sure. They're superficially committed. I like what it looks like on the bo- model box, you know, the picture. But don't ask me to do all that stuff and, put, and stay with this and put it all together. No. Huh? That's what kids do. They're superficially committed. They're willfully defiant. They are easily influenced. Just watch how they act after they watch cartoons. Huh? Sure. They, they watch cartoon and they think they're Superman and they put on their bath towel and here they go. <laughs> You know, they're easily influenced. They can, little, little things like that can just really set their hearts and imaginations racing. And that's all good. You know, it's great to be a kid. But they are easily influenced, right? And then finally, children demand attention. I want to be seen and heard from. And you're going to hear from me. And you're going to know I'm here. And I'm going to be nice and loud, or I'm going to bang around. You know what? I'm going to bang some pans in the kitchen so you'll get the hint and come in and help me. Right? Or, you know, I demand attention. I mean, and uh, this is so childish. It's so childish when adults act this way. And... Uh, when we demand attention, we're easily influenced. Somebody can say one little word or one negative thing, and boy, you've bought the whole thing. Wow, that must be true. So easily influenced, and you wash back and forth. You don't know who you are when we act this way. Okay? And so Paul says, come on, Corinthians, grow up. Stop demanding attention. Stop being so easily influenced by little negative comments. Stop being so superficially committed when you run into a few challenges, stop being so willfully defiant and stomping your, your feet and demanding things that go your way. Did you know that this is one of the greatest acts of love you could demonstrate this morning if you'll just grow up and be a man or be a woman that honors the Lord? Listen, slide four, 13. I mean, I got to go. Uh, these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. All right. Paul gives them a new triad. All right. Prayer, language, prophecy, achieving heroic spiritual status. That was their biggies. And Paul replaces them. He says, what about faith, hope, love, faith? That, that in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, God has inaugurated the eschatological events leading to a new age and it's, it's, it's coming and it's going to break into our present age and it's going to be totally revamped and different. What about a life that gives faith 
a life that faith can live like this. What about hope, he says, the hope that enables the faithful to endure the sufferings that they're currently in and that other problems that they may have, the hope that maybe tomorrow will get better. And what about, instead of being sensational martyr, what about just love? Love every day. Love people that you encounter because it's what holds community together. And so, friends, you've you've stayed with me now and let me get passionate. I'm not angry, okay? Let me get passionate. Sometimes when I get passionate, It maybe comes across as anger, but it's not anger. It's passion. I really believe this. I really believe this. And and if I restated all of it, you know, maybe if I, when I get passionate, if I smile more, (laughs) maybe that would help, would right? Smile more. I could smile when I'm passionate. All right? And so uh, let me smile while I get passionate about this. And I'm looking over all this material and I'm thinking, you know, what? What is it that we need to hear? What could really revolutionize us? And and I think as we look at this, instead of using a sensational display of spiritual utterance to gain attention, and it is one of the spiritual gifts, so it's legit. We're not disparaging that. But instead of pursuing that as the biggie, how about just getting up and going to work every day and using all of your words to build up other people in a way that engenders faith in them. Try that out. And uh, instead of wowing the crowd with all the future will bring, and don't misunderstand, I love prophecy, and I've done a whole series of messages on Revelations, okay? Okay. But instead of wowing the crowd with all that the future may bring, how about giving someone just a little bit of hope that their tomorrow will be brighter because you're in their life loving them? How about that? And instead of becoming a a hero or celebrity, and there's nothing wrong with that if God uh, gives you a platform, you know, uh, a special gifting and ability and you can use those giftings and abilities to honor him. Okay. But instead of becoming or angling for hero status, how about just doing little acts with great love every day for as long as you have life? I've shared with you before, you have all the spiritual gifts you need. We don't need sensational people at Stones Hill. We need radically committed people who will love like this every day. You know, uh, I want to wrap it up with a story of love. It really is an incredible story of love. It defies all the odds. And true stories are always full of both ugliness and beauty. Okay. And this one's no different. It comes out of Auburn University. And you might think that the latest great thing to come out of Auburn University was the touchdown that Chris Davis scored with no time left on the clock and a 28-28 score. I was going to show you that clip, but we're running a little limited on time here this morning. So just know that the Alabama field goal was short. Davis fielded the short kick, ran 109 yards uh, for the touchdown, and it was a come-from-behind victory. It was an extraordinary story, and everybody thinks Auburn's the greatest thing. And they're going to play tomorrow. And probably some of you guys are getting uh, waiting with bated breath, right? You're waiting for that game. You want to see what happens against Florida State. But I want to tell you another story that comes out of Auburn that's, I think, a lot better than that one. A married woman was sexually assaulted in California, and she becomes pregnant happened several years ago and compounding her pain her husband gives her an ultimatum he says abort the baby and if you don't i'll divorce you and that's the ugly part of the story again she's assaulted sexually she uh, a, a baby results from this and the woman decides courageously that she's not going to have an abortion that instead she's going to give birth. She moves to Alabama. She's put in touch with a Christian adoption agency called Lifeline Children's Services. And Peggy Dutton and her husband 
are on the board of Lifeline, and they get to know this courageous woman who uh, has conceived a baby. And this, ba- this woman gives birth to a child, and this, this couple that runs this Lifeline, they agree to adopt Molly's baby, or this woman's baby. And two days after Molly's birth, they adopt her, and the little girl that was born was named Molly. And she grows up living an average suburban life, and she attends Auburn University now. She's a horticultural student. And almost no one there knew her story until friends urged her to run for homecoming queen. And so Molly chose alternatives for women facing crisis pregnancy as her theme, as her platform for this homecoming event. And she told her story, and it spread like wildfire, and it became kind of a viral deal. Slide 16. To kind of tell you the end of the story, this lady who was conceived by virtue of a sexual crime, but a mom who would not abort her, this young lady is the homecoming queen 2013 at Auburn University. Beautiful lady. And uh, I think it, it's been a huge response to her story and it, I think it really does show how much the public wants to receive life and to love and, it, and like I said it's been a viral story and I want you to watch this uh, clip just go ahead and run that clip you guys can kind of get a feel for this story last weekend Auburn University well I guess if this thing no, comes up short he can uh, field it that's the and run it out. All right, here yeah, we go. There we go. This past weekend, we Auburn go, University you. crowned. Well, I guess yeah. if this okay. thing comes up Okay, now we're short, playing together. It. We're having fun. And run it All out. Right. All right, here we go. Yo, you had it right. Go back. This past weekend, Auburn University yeah. crowned its 100th homecoming queen. And Auburn University in this homecoming is Molly Ann Dutton. But it's Molly's, Molly Ann's personal story that is inspiring the nation this morning. Her biological mother became pregnant after being sexually assaulted, and she was pressured by her husband at the time to abort the unborn child or face divorce. But along with the support of a Christian adoptive agency, Molly Ann was born and immediately adopted into a loving family. 22 years later, she's using her own voice to help other women choose life. Joining us now, Auburn University's newly crowned homecoming queen, Molly Ann Dutton. Welcome, and thanks for being with us, Molly Ann. Thank y'all for having me. You know, your mom's story is certainly one of struggle and also just perseverance and making a choice for life. And the fact that you decided to take up that cause um, and do something about it is remarkable. Tell everyone how that decision came about to do that. Absolutely. I knew if I wanted to share one story on Auburn's campus, I did want it to be impactful and reach all different areas of Auburn's campus and through the encouragement of two of my friends and um, we were actually at lunch and we kind of tossed a couple of ideas out there and I walked away from the table and they started chatting and I came back to the table and their eyes were vibrant and I asked them what are y'all talking about and they said Molly and you need to share your story because I have been graced with a very impactful story yes. and um, from there, all three of us started tearing up, which isn't very rare for three women to get together and right. start crying. But, however, it was just confirmation that that's the words that Auburn were gonna, was going to hear. Well, they certainly knew your story. Uh, will you share with America now the story that got you to this point of your mom at Absolutely. 22? Yeah, I'm actually the youngest of six kids, and the latter four of us are all adopted, so we filter in from all different families. And my biological mom was a young married woman who lived in California, and through some series of events, she found herself the victim of sexual assault and pregnant through that act. And um, she went to talk to her husband and talk through this, and he just faced, or gave her an ultimatum to either abort the child or suffer a divorce. But that's when her journey did take her down south to Birmingham, Alabama. And there in Birmingham, she found Lifeline Adoption Agency. And Lifeline is not just an adoption agency, but it serves as a banner for education, prevention, and support for women and men going through those really critical times in their lives. So my mother walked into the office and needed counseling and because that resource was made available to her she decided to give birth to me and here I am sitting here before y'all 22 years later declaring how radiant my life has been and um, 
like you said earlier, my, um, my parents were actually serving on the board of Lifeline when my birth mother walked in the doors, and that's where those lines connected. And since then, I have been in a very loving home. And lighting up the world, you certainly are. Talk about Light Up Life. This is your true cause. There have been glow sticks and T-shirts out there, and that's your slogan. What does that mean to you and everyone? Yes, yeah, so we really um, were very interested to see how we were going to display this. What's been hilarious is the from Friday to Monday of this past week, we tried to prepare ourselves how 25,000 Auburn students were going to receive this story. And we had no idea how the public was going to receive the story. That was just not in our mindset. And we knew there were a lot of stigma or there words like sexual assault or abortion or even life carries a stigma in itself, mm -hmm. a negative stigma. Um, however, we knew that we wanted to make it fun and to know that life is so light and radiant. And that's how Light Up Life began. And we tossed around like this is a story of restoration and hope and those were in the mix of all of this, but Light Up Life was so perfect because it is something to be celebrated. And like you said, we had glow sticks and t-shirts. We passed out daisies on the Aww. concourse just to celebrate what life really is. You know, Molly and Dutton, you are a difference maker. You're a living proof of that. And I love that the choice of life is something you're bringing to the foreground. Um, we wish you well. You're graduating this year and you continue to just light up life around you. Thanks for being with Thank us this so morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, only God. You know, and what a mature, um, loving, um, love-centered decisions that were made to result in this life. Only God can take something so horrible and create something so beautiful. And that's what I'm asking you to do, is to love in a way that defies ex explanation. The woman had every right to terminate that pregnancy. Every right. But she, something in her chose to do something different. Because she felt motivated by a force unlike any other forces around her and people that she was listening to. And now this beautiful person gets to share the love of Jesus only by, because of the grace and love of God. So, you know, guys, uh, what I would just say to you this morning is that life is short. You can spend your time hating and hating on people, but I tell you what, when you get to the end of the road, it's not going to be how successful you were at hating people. It's who you loved and who you really cared about and how you invested in their life. Uh, and when I think about Jesus, you know, he's the ultimate spiritual gift guru, right? I mean, he has all of them. Like, he was a prophet. He spoke the words of God. He was a servant. He watched, uh, we watched him gird his waist and wash the feet of his disciples. He was a teacher. He was an encourager. He was a, he was a, a leader who organized for the church's future. He was a mercy shower. The lame and the, and the broken and the blind felt safe with him. I mean, here's a guy that had all the spiritual gifts. And friends, if you don't know him, you'll never, ever be able to see your life accomplish all it was meant to accomplish. And so the ultimate gift you can open is the person of Jesus here as we start a new year. And, uh, and one of the grievous, most grievous things here, and stay with me, I'm wrapping up, okay? The, one of the most grievous things is to not to think that you would live your life and never open the gift of Jesus. And we talk about all these other things, and it doesn't, it's not going to work unless Jesus is something that you personally open and say, Lord, I, I want you in my life. I want this dynamic body of believers to impact me and change me. And it's, it's kind of like, let's say you were good, I was a good friend of yours, and I sent you presents. And I, for like two or three years, I sent you personal presents. I wrapped them up nice and neat. Well, I don't wrap nice and neat, okay? I wrapped them up. They're in something. I sent these to you for two years. The time finally comes. I get to come visit you, right? And you, you're taking a shower, and I get nosy. 
okay, and I start looking in your closets and stuff, and I look in a closet, and I see all those presents I sent for the last two years unopened in the corner in your closet. How do you think it's going to make me feel? Now you're starting to get it. When you refuse to open your gifts, it's grievous. It's, it's like, Christ is like, man, I have all this to offer in and through them, and they won't open it. And ultimately, I've given them the gift of me, and they won't even open that. You see, this is important. You have something to offer. Let's start with love. And let's understand how some of the specifics of how it's supposed to work. But let's, let's come out of this little subset in the series on love. Let's come out of this with a firmer commitment. I'm going to open the gift of Jesus. I'm going to open my spiritual gift. I'll discover and open that. I'm going to use it in the body. And I'm, I'm going to stop acting so childish, stomping my feet, demanding I be attend, uh, attended to, and et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to show and demonstrate love. And I'm going to open these gifts. So I think we're getting it. Let's pray together. And uh, I'll let you go, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here in a warm place where we can sit comfortably, listen to inspirational stories, uh, dig into the Bible, uh, correct errant viewpoints, modify worldviews that are getting off track, and uh, be challenged and confronted with our sin and with our hesitancy to let Jesus be Lord of everything. God, this is a good place to be. I know football is awesome, and we're going to enjoy that later, I'm sure. But this is pretty awesome because it kind of plays out every, in every area of life. And so I just pray on this first uh, January 5th Sunday, this first Sunday of the new year, that if somebody's here, they haven't opened the gift of Jesus, they would do it today. It, right now, right where they sit, they would open the gift. And then I pray that those who have been energized by your spirit to do some really special things, that they would open up their hearts and lives to do this. You're calling them. You're inviting them out to a, a spiritual adventure, and it awaits their willing participation. And then I thank you for those radical acts of love like we've just seen on the screen. Only you can work in a heart like that. Only you can do it. And I ask and pray that if there's those here who need a story of love to invade their stories, that it would happen this moment, this week, this stage of life. And you would do the extraordinary and take the ugliness of our true stories and interject your beauty into them. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. Thank you. You've been a great group. Have a great day. Be safe. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Bless you.